We're starting into chapter five. Now this is basically the same age group as chapter four, but we're looking more at their social emotional development at this point, whereas the other one's a lot more focused on the cognitive. Well, if we're going to talk about social emotional development, we have to talk about Eric Erickson. Erickson, as we discussed in chapter one, was a little different than most of the other psychologists because he had a lifelong um, developmental theory, as you can see here. Now, we're just going to cover these first ones right here in this chapter, and the other ones will get covered as we move throughout the course. You will need to know all of these eventually. Um, they are something, again, that tends to show up on your national exams. But Erickson believed that personal development in steps or stages throughout your lifetime and that social experiences, those interactions you have, those relationships you have, he believed that those had a huge impact across a person's whole life. His, his theory worked on a principle that each stage paved basically this path to the next stage of life, that each part of your life had some sort of a conflict that would directly impact your development as a person if you didn't overcome that. Now, sometimes they were called crises, sometimes they were called opportunities. Either way, same thing, he just used two different terminology. And what would happen is you would either develop this quality and your path of psychological development was good or you didn't develop this quality and then you had a problem as you moved into the, the next time. Now, sometimes um, what would happen is, is if you were successful in one, then you tended to be more successful in the next one. But you could also lose some of them as you move forward. So again, we'll kind of talk about this in more detail as you go through these different stages. But his whole thought was that if you develop these, then you would have a smoother and happier life as you went from birth basically to older adult. Erickson first stage is trust versus mistrust. And this happens between birth and 18 months old. Now the important event in this particular time frame is feeding. Uh, you have to remember that at this point in a child, they're, they're basically completely dependent upon adult caregivers for everything that they need. Um, that includes food, warmth, loving, safety, nurturing. If any of these things that are critical to our development as a person isn't given, then that child is going to suffer. So if the caregiver fails to provide any a kind of adequate care or love, the child um, will become feeling that he or she may not be able to trust or depend on adults in their lives. And this ability for the child then can diminish. Now, the other thing we have to remember is that the only way that the child has to communicate at this point is crying. It's very limited. So the response of the caregiver quickly to a crying child will help the child develop trust. We have to understand that um, a child who's very young, let's say up to six months, if they're crying, there's a, a, there's a real reason. There's something that is upsetting them. They're not being bad but because it's the only way for them to express it. Unfortunately, we don't always understand why the child is crying. We may think we know, but many times parents are really misdirected on what they believe is happening with the child. A very classic example is a child who I will hear, and I, I've heard this from parents, oh, you know, my child's so fussy. They always cry when I put him down. They just want me to hold them all the time. I don't understand what's wrong with this child. It just, it constantly wants to be held. It's so um, needy. Well, take the child to the doctor and what you find out eventually is that the child has acid reflux. And so every time you put the child down in bed, the acid reflux goes into the throat, which burns the throat. So the child cries. Then the child gets a little sip of milk because the parents think, oh, they're hungry. And the child stops crying because the milk soothes the throat. And the child learns very quickly through operant conditioning that laying down is not a good thing. It hurts. So they don't want to lay down. It's not so much that they want you all the time as much as they don't want to lay down. And so, you know, that inability to understand what's going on with a child can 
basically begin to develop mistrust, especially if parents are beginning to feel tired and they don't understand what's going on and why is a child acting this way. We just have to remember that crying is the only communication that many of these children have. We just talked about speech and speech development isn't there. So it's really important for parents and for you who can be caregivers, nurses and things like this to understand that there is a reason a child is crying. There's something that is not right. It may not always be physically, but crying needs to be addressed because it could be a way that we're going to develop mistrust. So caregivers who are inconsistent or emotionally unavailable or even just reject the feeling that the child is having, then that child is going to begin to develop um, a lack of trust in human beings. And a failure to develop trust will result in fear and belief that the world is inconsistent and unpredictable. Now, the truth is no child is going to develop a 100% sense of trust or a 100% sense of doubt. Um, Erickson actually stated he believed that development was more about striking a balance between the two opposite sides, that when this happened, the child acquired hope then, which Erickson described as an openness to experiencing tempered by some wariness of danger that may be present. Um, just to kind of understand that without trust, there can't be hope. Now, one of the things that's interesting about trust, and this is sort of a little side note, is that there have been some studies recently that shows that the level of trust that a person may have might have some genetic makeup to it. Also, that they've pretty much now determined that the level of mistrust and distrust a person has is basically learned from your family and your social influences around you. So if you have learned to mistrust or um, distrust certain groups of people, um, then that's going to stay with you and you learn it really, really early. And that's kind of the scary part. So the next one is autonomy versus shame and doubt. Here we've got 18 to probably three, although some kids might be two and moving out of this stage, more likely the girls and the boys. But the big important thing, as you can see, is going to be toilet training. Why? Because at this point in development, children are starting to gain a little bit of independence. They're starting to want to perform some basic actions on their own, make some simple decisions about what they prefer. And now, by allowing kids to make these choices to gain some control, parents and um, caregivers are helping children to develop that sense of autonomy. Autonomy is important because autonomy leads to independence. Kids are dependent, though, still on the caregivers for safety and for direction. So this balance has to be there between the two. Now, Erickson, he kind of believed that learning to control one's old body function led to this feeling of control and sense of independence. Um, if you really think about this, you know, the fact that my bladder controls me rather than me controlling my bladder, that leads to a sense of feeling of of lack of the of independence um, as elderly people get older and they might become incontinent quite often a lot of times they really feel this shame um, because they feel like i have lost this ability to control a basic bodily function so if a little kid can gain that that feels like they've lost a, they've gained a lot of control over who they are they also like to begin to control things like food choices and which toys they do and maybe even which clothes they want to wear. Now, the children who are successful at completing this stage feel like secure and confident, while those who are not, well, they're left usually feeling pretty inaccurate and they tend to have a lot of self-doubt. Now, Erickson believed that achieving a balance between autonomy and shame and doubt would lead to what they call will, which is a belief that children can act with intention and with reason within limits. Now, how does one foster this is the question. You need to provide opportunities for kids to be independent. Let them make some choices. As an example, perhaps once a week, they can choose what a family is going to have for dinner. Now, that doesn't mean that you give them a gazillion choices because the poor kid will be overwhelmed. But you can do is have two choices. You can say, OK, honey, tonight you can choose. Are we having macaroni and cheese or are we having beanie weenies? And let the kid make the choice. Um, what's kind of interesting is, is that if you let kids begin to make choices early, you can lead them into later things that really help them. They'll want to do these things. They'll gain this um, independence, this feeling that they can do it, rather than being told all the time what to do. Now, 
the other thing, of course, unfortunately, is toilet training. And that can be really frustrating to us as parents, but toilet training is really important. One, we have to remember that girls' bodies develop sooner than boys, so girls quite often will get toilet training first, not because they're smarter, but simply because the nerves within the body has grown to allow girls to understand that their bladders are full. For boys, this nerve growth can take a lot longer. In fact, for many boys, they may not get those nerves or that feeling that they need to go to the bathroom um, overnight until you know, they're, they're 10. So we do have boys who are still wearing pull-ups at 10 and 12. It is just the way of the biological body developing itself. The boys go to a very deep sleep. They're so asleep. They just, things just roll out. You might want to say. The other thing is, is that there is a psychological aspect to going to the bathroom. And we probably all have seen a kid, if, if we've had any kids who are in toilet training, who run to the corner and you know they're pooping and you say, are you pooping? And you hear that, no, no, no. And yet, you know, right there, they're pooping and lying to your face. And so the question is, is why are they doing this? Well, there can be many different reasons, but here's one of the funny ones is that you and I as an adult, we have a cognitive understanding of how the body works. But if you're asking a two-year-old who basically has just figured out they even exist, who's basically just figured out that voice in their head is their voice, you're asking them to understand the digestive system? No, sorry, they don't get it. Now, the little picture I have here is a boy sitting on the toilet. And sometimes this actually scares kids, not because they're sitting on the toilet and they feel like they may fall in, but more because you're flushing part of them away, especially the poop. Now, the pee, that kind of just disappears into the water and it just looks like water I'm swirling down. But the poop, that's part of me. That, that's me. And I'm going away. And where am I going? I don't want it to leave. Bring it back. See, you can tell them it's that peanut butter and jelly sandwich they ate yesterday, but it don't look like no peanut butter and jelly sandwich I ever ate. And they're just barely creating schemas. So, uh, you know, don't give them a whole lot of thought here. They, they may develop a little fear for a little while when they're beginning to realize what happens to this stuff. Now, there is kind of a funny trick you can try with some of these kids, um, and that is to feed them a meal of corn. Because if anybody's ever looked at their poop after they've eaten just corn, you notice that corn still sort of stays the same. And so this might be one way to show a child that what they ate is what's coming out of them. Now, it doesn't work with all kids, but it does work with a lot of kids. And kids are very fascinated by poop because it is something that came out of their body. It's part of them and they want to understand it because it looks very different and it can smell like dinner a couple of nights ago. So... Yeah, kind of a fun time, but the big thing is, is trying to be as supportive as possible when it comes to toilet training. Makes a huge difference. Now, the last phase is initiative versus guilt. And basically what we're talking about in this third stage um, is something that's going to take place in these early preschool kids age or just before they kind of go to school. So from three to about five. And some of the most important events here is this ability to explore and to play. Now in the third stage, what's happened is hopefully the first two stages have been successful. So the child feels like there's a trustworthy environment. And as they're moving on to preschool, they have learned that they can achieve a few things by themselves. Now the children wants to begin to assert their power and control through play and through other social interactions. They want to pick who they play with. They want to pick what activities they do. They, they want to have some power over their choices. So kids who are over-directed, they may struggle later on to develop a sense of initiative, to have confidence in their own abilities and choices. You know, they might even fear trying new things because they might be wrong because they were told they were wrong or they don't feel that you've had confidence or anybody's had confidence that they can do this correct. But children who are successful at this stage, they feel capable. They're able to lead others. Those who fail to acquire these skills are quite often left with this feeling of guilt, self-doubt, this lack of initiative. 
So an ideal balance would be that a person has some initiative and some willingness to work with others to achieve. And this quality would be known as purpose would emerge. There is no purpose if I don't think I'm going to be successful. So why should I bother to try? And while we may be thinking sometimes that we're really helping these kids, what we really tend to be doing is killing their purpose. So maybe your child brings you this lovely little drawing that they have. And when you look down, the dog has got three legs on it. Now they say it's your dog, Sparky. And your dog, Sparky, has four legs. You may say, well, you know, Sparky does have four legs. Well, what you've kind of told the child is that their drawing isn't good enough. How do you know that leg isn't behind another leg? You know, the point is, is that the child has drawn Sparky. And it wasn't supposed to be an absolute representation of Sparky. After all, the kid is, what, four? Um, so we do things that may, in, in the long run, sometimes make our kids feel more guilty. Maybe a kid goes and puts some dishes in the dishwasher because they're feeling, you know, like, I can do that. I can put my dish away. And they haven't put it away exactly the right way. And you go by and you say, well, let me show you how you do this right. And what have you just told them? That what they did was wrong. And why try? Because they didn't do it right. Yeah, you know, that might mean that you have to run a dishwasher with some dishes that aren't exactly set correctly. But, you know, they've given an initiative and they were successful. Now, this doesn't mean that we give a trophy to every kid who participates in a sport. That is not what we're talking about here. What we are talking about for little kids here, and we are talking about preschoolers, is letting them have some willingness and some success in what they try. Now the picture you see I have here is the kid is trying to crack an egg, but notice the kid isn't left alone. The kid has help to learn to crack the egg and how to sort the things. And they, they do need to be able to make some mistakes, too. Those people who do everything for them and don't allow them to make mistakes also tends to tell the kid that they don't have the capacity to do this thing. So there has to be some sort of balance. Now, there is another kind of concept that we talk about when we bring Erickson in. And again, I've, I've talked about Maria Montessori, but I, I'm going to bring her in here because one of the things she really felt with Erickson um, was this initiation and guilt phase was extremely important for the long term development of children um, to succeed for themselves. And so one of the things that Maria Montessori felt was that nothing should be in the kids territory that they weren't allowed to be with or touch or play which basically in this case would be their room so why would you put an outfit in the room hang it in their closet if they're not allowed to wear that outfit you're basically teasing them with that outfit so here's this pretty little dress that this girl wants to wear it's hanging in her closet every day she sees it but she's not allowed to wear that dress so even if she takes it down because we're not talking about three-year-olds having a whole lot of uh, self-control or four-year-olds having a lot of self-control she takes it down she puts it on and you get all upset because she's wearing this dress well the truth is is it may not have should be in her room why is it there Everything in their space, everything that's within their territory should be something that they can touch, something they can reach, something that they can achieve with. Because if we don't, then we're basically making them feel guilty. So you may have a child who wants to dress themselves. After all, if they're in autonomy and shame stage, that's one of the things they want to do. They want to make some choices. But at the same point, you don't know if you can take those stripes and polka dots that they like to put together. So a simple thing. Get yourself 10 hangers with little clips and make 10 outfits. To be honest, shorts and things like that aren't that expensive. Put a pair of shorts, put a shirt, put an underwear, put the socks, put it all together and hang it in the closet. And then the kid can just take the hanger out. Now, the other thing is we can't overwhelm the kids with choices. So if a kid is at that point where they want to dress themselves and do all this, take two or three outfits out, hang them on the doorknobs and say in the morning you pick from these but the truth is if a kid goes into the closet and picks another one to wear unless there's some real reason why they can't wear that then let them wear it and if it's something that they really shouldn't be wearing it shouldn't be in their closet and if you don't want them pulling everything out of their drawers and put everything on hangers with clips and they won't be able to pull everything out of the drawers 
this is only going to last for a couple of years, folks. It will really make your life easier if you kind of can do these things. But it also will give them this sense of purpose. I've got a purpose for doing this. I've got a purpose to move forward. Attachment is a critical element for the development of any human. If we think back on what Erickson just said, you'll notice that attachment was critical to the very first stage of trust and mistrust. If there isn't attachment, then we don't develop trust. In fact, attachment will become this engine later on with our social, emotional, and, and our cognitive development. What we know is that attachment provides infants with this coping system. Basically, it sets up this sort of mental representation of their caregiver in their mind. And when they need it, they can summon this to sort of comfort them when that person may not be around or in a difficult moment, they can use that person to give them some sort of stability. What attachment does do is it allows infants to separate from the caregiver without distress because attachment allows me to still be connected to you even if I'm not physically with you, which means that I can then go explore my world some and still know that there's someone sort of around, someone there for me. Now, why we know this is so important to people is that research has shown that Infants who have attachments early or develop attachments actually stimulate certain areas of the brain to grow. And when those areas are stimulated, attachment will then become even more important to them. And later on, these same individuals also tend to be able to develop stable relationships with others. Now, neuroscientists believe that attachment is such a primal need that there's actually this network of neurons in the brain that's dedicated to setting in motion um, the processes to make this happen. There are actual hormones that are linked directly to attachment within the brain. Now, as you read there, attachment, though, is not automatic. It happens in stages. And so that's what we're going to look at next is sort of the stages of attachment. As I said in the last slide, we're going to talk a little about some steps toward attachment. Now, I will say this, though, that there is many different theorists out there that talk about attachment. Your book presents John Bull. Um, one of the reasons that they present them is that he's sort of the most modern theorist, you might want to say, out there. He just died in 1990, so he's a pretty new guy. Um, evolutionary theory of attachment suggests that children come into the world biologically pre-programmed to form attachment with others. Um, this is because it helps them survive. Those who seem to be attached to somebody were more likely to receive comfort and protection, and they absolutely have shown that they're more likely to survive in adulthood. This is not just seen in humans, but this is also seen in the great apes. This is seen in most of the mammals. So when we have an attachment, it helps our survival. So infants produce this sort of innate social release behavior, such as crying and smiling, that sort of stimulates this innate caregiver response um, from us as adults. Now, by the way, the reason I'm saying caregiver is that it isn't always the mother. I don't want this thought to be in your head that it has to be the mother. This can be the father. This can be the grandparent. This can be an adopted person. Um, it doesn't have to be a biologically the mother. So we use the word caregiver to be a more general type of uh, scenario because there are different people who this could occur to. Now, the determinant of the attachment we found out, uh, Bowles found out, is that it's not food, but care and responsiveness seems to be the primary one. And the reason we mentioned this is that for a long time, the thought was, is those who feed are who they become attached to. Well, not really. It's more about caring. So even if um, we had somebody else who was feeding them all the time, but they weren't the primary caregiver, such as, let's say, a wet nurse was at one point, but somebody else was the caregiver, they would attach to that person. Now, what he suggests is that a child would initially form only one primary attachment, and that attachment figure acted as a secure base for exploring the word. 
the world, sorry, the attachment to a relationship acts as sort of like this prototype for all my future social relationships. So having something disrupt this can have some very severe consequences. He also believed that, or at least he suggested, that there's this critical time period for the development of attachment between zero and five years. That if an attachment hasn't developed during this per time period, a child will suffer basically something that's unreversible as far as their development. Um, it would perhaps even reduce their intelligence and increase their aggression. And we have seen that children who don't have attachment quite often don't get attention. And that lack of attention does develop, as we've mentioned before, certain brain ab abnormalities. So attention is not something that children want. Attention is something that children have to have. How do they get that attention? Well, they develop an attachment. Now that person is sort of bought into taking care of this particular small human who can't take care of themselves. So when you look down through these and you look in your, your other material, you can see though that real attachment to one person doesn't really happen until about seven months old. At that point, we get something called separation anxiety. Yes, we get the crying kids. And you're like, wait a minute, this little baby I could pass around to anybody and it didn't cry at all. And now all of a sudden, if I leave for two seconds, the kid falls apart. Well, that's because they finally have a true attachment to something. And you have to remember that a little kid, we are talking seven to 18 months old, they wear their emotions on their sleeve. Well, if they have a sleeve. Basically, they can't control their emotion. Their emotional center is just there. So what they know is that you're leaving and I don't want you to leave. So stay here and I'm not happy because you're leaving and I don't want you to leave. And so thus separation anxiety happens. The nice thing is, is that, you know, about after 18 months, they begin to understand that there's a schedule and that the caregiver will be back. Why do they get this? Because they have more brains. Remember, they don't even know who they are between 7 to 18 months. They don't even know what that voice, if they even have a voice at that point in their head. Don't give these poor little guys a lot of abilities. They basically are just pure instinct. So they begin to understand the, the caregiver's schedule. A decline in separation protests begin to happen. Although you can see an incline again when they get to be about two or three in some cases, you know, depending on if it's boy or girl, because what they've begun to realize is that you might be gone for longer periods of time, or they may have now have their ability to have some attention. And so before they didn't even notice you were gone, you dropped them off at daycare. They were like, Ooh, toy and walked toward the toy and didn't even notice you going out the door. But now they kind of know when you get to be two that while I love that toy, the truth is, is you're about to leave and I don't like that. I want you to stay because I enjoy you. But if you also notice that by the time you get to the car, the kid has stopped crying and they're happily playing. You have to remember again that their emotions are on their sleeve and we'll cover emotions a little bit later in this uh, lecture today. So following up with attachment, Boyle believes that there are four distinct characteristics of attachment. The first one is proximity maintenance. Basically, there's this desire to be near the people we're attached to. And safe havens. Kids want to return to that attachment figure for comfort and safety, especially when they have a fear or they have a threat which means that these attachment people act as a secure base from which a child can explore, surround, come back to. And finally, he also said that there should be some separation anxiety. Basically, when they leave, there should be some sort of a distress that the attachment figure isn't there. So in the 1970s, Mary Answorth wanted to follow up on some of this work, and she came up with sort of a groundbreaking uh, research study. She took these 12 month to 18 months old, so they're really little, and they would go into a room with their primary caregiver, the one they were most attached to. Then the caregiver would leave. What they did is they observed the behavior of the child, and the caregiver would return not too long after that, and again, they would observe the behavior of the child. Had it changed, or was there something different that had occurred? So what they found was that there was definitely patterns of behavior and with some additional research by a few other people we've kind of come up with four 
types of attachment relationships. Now, I do want to say that in most cases, these names of these um, types of attachment relationships are pretty standard. A few of them, though, seem to flip flop when I look at different books and different theorists, um, newer names versus older names. So while I think most of your nurses, you won't have to know the exact attachment relationships names for your psychology students, make sure you stick with the one that your instructor uses um, as far as that. But almost all of them have the first one, which is the secure attachment. Basically, what we have here is children who can depend on their caregiver and they do show distress when they're separated and they show joy when they're reunited. Although the child may be upset, what we do find is that they feel assured that the caregiver will return. So when frightened, the securely attached child are comfortable or are confident in seeking reassurance from their caregiver. The next one are the avoidance attachment. Now, avoidance children attachment tends to avoid the parent or the caregiver. They tend to show no preference between a caregiver and a complete stranger. Now, remember that these are children who should have by now at least shown some preference and attachment. Now, when we see this type of behavior, this may be a signal that there's some sort of abuse or neglect from the caregiver. However, it could also be that there are children who haven't yet attached because of the age, 12 to 18 months. We also know that there are attachment disorders that are out there. So it is one that we're very leery of when we see. We like to investigate a little bit more. Now, what happens is, is that if these children don't learn to attach or rely on a caregiver, they may avoid basically making any kind of relationships in the future or have a very difficult time making those relationships in the future. The next one that we're going to take a look at is what's called disorganized attachment. Um, these children display a confused mix of behaviors. They seem disoriented, they seem dazed, maybe even confused. Sometimes they avoid or resist the parent. Sort of this lack clear, clear attachment pattern is likely to um, be more because of the caregiver behavior. There may be an inconsistency in how the caregiver behaves. In such cases, uh, patients and parents may serve as both a source of comfort and fear leading to sort of this disorganized behavior because the child doesn't quite know how to react to the parent. And the last one is ambivalent. I believe your book says resistant. Um, first of all, these children become very distressed when the parent leaves. They might even reject the parent by refusing any comfort or open display of direct, and they might even have some direct aggression toward these parents when they come back. As a result, this could be poor parenting availability. Um, these children can't depend on their primary caregiver to be there when they need them. The nice thing is that this doesn't happen very often. It's estimated only about 7 to 15 percent of U.S. children may fall into this, this particular group. Generally, the information on this slide is not a surprise to anybody that the father-infant relationship is different than the mother-infant relationship, primarily because in most societies, the father is the playmate. The father plays more rough and tumble than the mother does. The mother tends to be much more about reading and talking with the kids. So when the kid falls down and gets a boo-boo when he's playing with dad, he'll run to mom because mom is the comfort giver. But when mom may be sort of talking and they want to be rough and tumble and they want to run out and be loud, they're going to go find dad. It's just simply a difference in approaches and not one is better than the other. The children need both. But in society, at least as of today, this is the difference in approach. Now, this may also be a somewhat biological thing um, in that for the way that women communicate and the way that men communicate, there is a difference in that. And that difference may be applying down to how we interact with our kids. At least that's what research says. What we go into next is a very complex subject, emotions. And if you just even think about your own emotions, it's very complex. 
So we're not going to get too deep into these. I want you to know that some of the basics because you are going to be dealing with children, you're going to be dealing with adults, and you deal with emotions every day. For the psychology majors, you're going to go much deeper into this as you go through your major classes. There are, though, we do know, or at least we sort of agreed upon, that there are two basic groups of emotions. There are basic emotions and complex emotions. Now, even though many psychologists have accepted the theory of basic emotions, there's really no consensus about the price number of emotions. So one very famous um, psychologist, Robert Plunkett, said that there were eight emotions, anger, fear, sadness, disgust, surprise, anticipation, trust, and joy, and he arranged them on a color wheel. Very, very popular. Now, another one that's pretty popular is Paul Eckelman. Originally, he proposed that there were seven basic emotions, and that's what you're seeing here in this picture is seven basic emotions. Now, what's interesting is that he comes back and he changes it to six. He basically, what he does is he eliminates this one right here, contempt. Why does he eliminate that? Because what he says is, is that basically the emotions, basic emotions, I'm going to make this in red and say, there we go, that basic emotions are something that are universal. And that universality about them, it doesn't matter whether you're uh, here in the United States or you're a baby over in New Zealand or you're Russian, that they are shared. And he really felt that contempt, at least the face and the expression of them, was not shared. However, in recent studies, they found that disgust and anger also shared some similarities. And so recently, we have sort of eliminated disgust and anger, which is bringing us down to basically four. So right now, what we're kind of at um, is that Happiness, sadness, fear, and surprise originally from Paul, but even those have been worked a little bit. So the difference between anger and disgust and the difference between fear and surprise, um, they're thought to have developed later in social functions, and they're not really for survival purposes. And we really think emotions were for survival purposes. As such, more modern psychologists have proposed that we humans have four basic emotions, and that's fear, anger, joy, and sadness. So if we take a look at this, what we have left is basically from Paul is sadness and we have fear and we have brought anger back, surprisingly enough. And you'll know that the last one, joy, I guess that's a kind of like happiness. So hopefully this sort of explains to you right now that there is a lot of disagreement in psychology about what basic emotions are, what basic emotions aren't. They're kind of in agreement that we have them. They're in agreement that they exist. They're in agreement that we're born with them. The disagreement is how many there are and how to call them. What name do we use for them? One thing we do know is that basic emotions develop over time. And, you know, I had a choice of showing you the sad babies or the socially smiling babies. And I went with the socially smiling babies, of course, far more fun to look at. Um, we generally see these, as you can see, these babies doing this, even when they're very, very small infants, they're cooing, they express pleasure to see each other. And then from four to six months, a new emotion emerges, and that is basically anger. Yep, those angry little faces begin to pop out. Um, quite often, this is more about frustration. They don't understand their goals. They don't understand words. Remember, they have basic little brains. Something isn't right, and they're trying to figure it out. So around six months old, strangey weirdness comes in. And yes, it doesn't matter who you are, even the President of the United States, he don't recognize you, you are a stranger, and I am upset. The other thing that tends to happen about at six months is basically disgust. And this lovely little face of this guy is a face it wouldn't matter if this was a six-month-old or a 17-month-old. 
or a 27 year old or a 37 year old we know that face that is the face of disgust so these basic emotions tend to be biological they tend to be with us and what's kind of interesting is is that we actually see them be there almost from the beginning as we begin to wire up and as we begin to have it in fact there are some psychologists who even argue that some of these emotions may even be there when we are born but we haven't wired our brain yet enough to make our face move because we have to learn how to move our face we have to learn how to move our eyebrows so we might even have disgust early on but we can't see it because the baby has no way to communicate it since they can't talk and they may not even be able to use those facial muscles yet so basic emotions are so called that because they're associated with this universal recognizable facial expressions in fact, complex emotions vary a lot in what they are like in different people, situations, and even in cultures. Although grief is often taken to be a blend of like surprise and denial and sadness and anger, grief can be entirely different from person to person and from culture to culture. We know that when we talk about the grieving process, we have some people who are going to experience loss by showing anger, others who are going to be furious others who will cry others who will perhaps hit a different mental state we don't show anything at all so different situations in different cultures give rise to these different facial expressions that's why it's not universally recognized and why we tend to say these are more complex in emotions um, what you see in front of you is basically what they call the color wheel of emotions and here what you're seeing is is how different emotions have combinations of things so if you want to look at something like oh awe over here we can see that it has a combination of different things that have combined to give you the feeling of awe but to be experienced children first must be able to understand what the self is and behave in a relationship which they've they've met standards of expectation so if i don't have any relationship if i don't know who i am i'm probably not gonna be able to experience complex emotions so the self-understanding you know we've already know that that comes somewhere around 18 to 24 months and the complex emotions are going to emerge shortly after that so you're going to see they'll say 18 to 24 months up to 30 months because now we understand who we are and once we understand who we are we now can experience complex emotions now Piaget viewed play as this integral part of the development of intelligence in, chil in children um, his theory of play argued that a child matures in their environment and play should encourage further cognitive and language development play is just so critical to the development of kids that even the World Health Organization says that a child who's not allowed to play is a child who's being tortured now we talked earlier about play and that was sort of a basic rundown of play but this one's a little bit more detailed so let me kind of run through these stages if we really want to talk about play so unoccupied play at this stage a baby is just making a lot of movements with their arms and legs and feet you know they're learning and discovering how their body moves and that amuses them they can even smile at themselves and giggle at themselves by certain movements that they do after all it's all new to them solitary play is a stage when the child plays alone they're not interested in playing with anyone quite yet so they play with a rattle by themselves they play with a bottle by themselves um, this can last all the way up to two years of age remember we still don't cognitively understand we even exist so the thought of cooperating with another person to play that's just beyond sort of our mental capacity when we're talking about a kid who's under two but a kid is still playing they're playing with blocks and then around two years of age they'll go into this thing called spectator or onlooker behavior during this stage the children like to watch other kids play but they don't play with them they're big observers of play and they love going to the park and you want them to go out and do something and they would much rather just sit with you and watch other kids play this is fine what they're doing is they're learning a lot about play behavior they're learning a lot about social interactions they will get there and then we already talked about that when they hit two 
a little over two years of age, after they've kind of done their spectator observation, the child will begin to play alongside others, but they don't quite play with them at this stage. It tends to be referred to as parallel play. So you see those twins, they're kind of playing parallel right there. Associative play starts happening around three or four. Now remember, at about three, we're still not understanding other people have different thoughts. This can be actually very difficult for kids to play together because each one thinks the other one's thinking like they're thinking. So we really begin to see more associative play probably happening with girls a little earlier because of brain development, the boys a little bit later. So when the child starts to interact with others during play, but there's not a large amount of of interaction at this stage. The child might be doing some activity related to other kids around them, but may not actually interact with the child. So let me give you an example. A kid may be playing on the same piece of playground equipment, but they're totally doing different things. Like one's climbing and one's swinging. And when you talk to them later on, they'll talk about how they played all day with Jimmy, even though you would look at it and say, well, you aren't really playing together, but they see themselves as playing together. They've sort of mutually selected to play in that place together. Then somewhere around four years of age, and, and the concept or, or the hypothesis is that children have to understand that other people have different thoughts and that their thoughts may not be the same as, as the thought they're having in order to get to cooperative play. Because here children play together with others and they have some sort of interest or activity that the others can involve and play in. They're participating in this cooperative play. And so rules and games have to be had, which means I need to understand that somebody else has a different thought than me. So these are really sort of the, the better breakdown of play than what your book has. It's a little bit more narrowly defined. I like this one better. Play is such an important thing that anytime we restrict any type of play, it generally doesn't bode well for the kids. So what about make-believe play? What about these make-believe people I make up? It's wonderful. Kids should actually have some make-believe in them. Imaginary play promotes imagination, sociability, adjustment. We also know that you know pretending to do something, to, to survive something or do something, can also help you sort of live through traumatic things or things that might come or even frightening topics. Growing up here in Florida, I can distinctly remember being little and playing hurricane. So make-believe is kind of an important thing. Now, one thing I do want to point out that there is something they wrote here, and I want to make sure that we understand the difference. It says 16 to 18 months olds understand the difference between pretend versus reality. And you might right now be saying, but wait a minute, I thought Paget said that um, they had this appearance of reality and that was scary. So let's explain the difference of what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is this little girl right here. If she looks on the television and she sees something, she's going to think that's real because she can see it. It's thus real. However, in this picture, she's playing by herself. So she's controlling the imagery and she knows that her little doll right here is not real. She knows it's not alive. So that's the difference between seeing something that somebody else has created versus something you do for yourself. One of the questions I always ask my class is, has anybody here ever done a coloring book? Now, we're talking about a kid's coloring book, not the new modern coloring books, but a kid's coloring book. And how successful were you at coloring in that page? Most of you were not very successful. Most of you got halfway done and gave up. Well, if you're a little kid who has less control of a crayon than you, and if you've ever tried to use a crayon, you know they are not as easy to use as you think. Kids get really frustrated with coloring books. They just scratch through it. It takes forever to color in a picture. And then if I get outside the lines or something wrong, we actually would say, for most psychologists would say, don't give a kid a coloring book. Better give them just some blank paper and a couple of pencils or pens and let them go at it. Let them make up their own imagery. Let them make up their own stories that they learn to be creative and create and look around them and decide what they want to put inside their imagery. It actually also will give you a lot into their psyche. Basically, you'll get to see a lot about what they are thinking inside. And when you're talking about a kid who's two or three years old who may not have good communication skills, this may let you know a lot about what's going on in there. 
So make believe we love it. In fact, the World Health Organization, remember, says a kid who isn't allowed to play is a kid who's being tortured. But is there a difference in gender and play? And there is to a point. Um, what we're saying is, is that we do know that peers tend to like to play with the same sex, especially between 24 to 36 months. Now, there are a couple of different hypotheses out there why this occurs, and that maybe when we get into kindergarten, we're back into playing with other kids. But usually we really still see that boys tend to gather together and girls tend to gather together. Um, one hypothesis is that we tend to play with our own sex because of basically the way we play, that the boys more like the rough and tumble and the competitive, the girls like more cooperative and pro-social orientation. And that's because of the difference that we have psychologically at this point. We know that for boys, the most important thing in boy structure is status. And you want to be the fastest, you want to be the tallest, you want to jump the furthest, you want to be number one. So when boys are playing together, it's all about the competition, but we call it friendly competition. Basically, you know, I can play with you hard out on the basketball court, but then go have a beer with you afterwards. Girls, on the other hand, are more about creating their groups. Girls survive within groups. They need their groups. And one group does not really intermix with another group. So where boys are more individualistic and they'll play with all different types of boys, girls, they tend to be a little bit more group oriented, which is kind of interesting because when we think about who would be more likely to accept somebody of the opposite sex within their group, most people would say, well, girls will be more likely to accept a boy who wants to come in and play in the dollhouse. And the answer is no, actually not. Boys will be much more likely to accept a girl who wants to come out and run a race with them or play basketball with them, as long as she's competitive and she doesn't mind getting dirty and sweaty, because it's all about showing that I'm number one. Girls, on the other hand, are all about the group. And when a boy comes in to play with their dollhouse or whatever group activity they're doing, a game or something like this, that boy is interrupting their group. And that's not where he belongs. And I'm defending my group. In fact, you can see this really strongly when you start to get to high schools. Girls will stay within their groups. We call them cliques. It's not really so much a click as much as a social pattern that probably has been well established from way back when we lived on the Great Plains of Africa. We need more than myself in order for my kid to grow up if I'm living out on the Great Plains of Africa. I have to have other sets of eyes looking out for predators because we were eaten. And if I'm somebody who's outside the group, I'm not going to have other females who are going to help me watch my kid and get my kid to adulthood. So what I need to learn to do is be cooperative with the other females within the group. And then we'll work together in order to get our kids basically to adulthood. If a male comes to fight with us, I'm probably not going to be able to take down that male myself. But if there's two or three females and we're all screaming at him and our kids are behind us, we have a better chance of chasing him off. So girls are all about cooperation, finding that group, staying with that group, defending that group, and bringing that group up as high in society as they can. So within that group, if we have a girl who wants to run for student body president and another one who wants to be the head of the drama department and somebody else who wants to go out for cheerleading. Generally, all the females within the group are going to support each one of these girls, even though they may be different. Whereas with boys, what you're going to find is that one boy wants to be the head of the government. The other one wants to be the head of this. And the boys will start getting competitive about that. They'll start maybe downplaying how much being the head of the student body is. They won't help make posters. They won't hang things up. The girls, meanwhile, are helping everybody. Why? Because if one or two of those girls actually get that position, if we get a girl who's the number one cheerleader and we get a girl who's the head of the student body, that raises all the girls in that group up. Whereas with the boys, if my 
person, this other person across from me gets to be the student body president, that's going to lower my position or my status, you might say, among the boys. So we do see that that play tends to be different and that play helps girls create the unity within their group where boys are using play also to help them define their social status. And that stays with them for almost all of their life. Same with the females. The book goes on to talk a little bit about helping others. And I bring this in just slightly so that we have a better understanding of what these are as we move forward and get into some of the older ages. Um, Pro-social behavior is just basically a behavior in which it helps somebody else. It's more about um, looking for ways to help a society, help another person that doesn't really benefit yourself. So um, helping somebody get a better job because they're going to get me a better job isn't really pro-social behavior. Going out and helping um, somebody after the hurricanes and you're helping them clear their yard, that's pro-social behavior because it makes nothing for you. So altruism is basically this pro-social behavior that doesn't have any benefit to myself, but it drives these feelings and responsibility toward others. So we already know by 18 months old that a kid can recognize somebody who's in distress. That's why when you start hearing one kid cry, they all begin to cry. In part, they understand this and they don't know why somebody else is upset. I'm upset too. I'll be upset with you. What we really want to be able to do is begin to help children understand pro-social behaviors and empathy. Now, remember that kids, until they're four years of age, really can't understand other people's thoughts and feelings. So when we're talking about young kids and we're talking about pro-social behavior there, what we want to do is play on the feelings that they're having. We want to model concern. We want to go ahead and emphasize when they see something. If they see a sad cat, then... You know, if there's something you can do for that cat, I don't mean have to take it home, but, you know, if you can give it a little water and that makes it feel better, then the child is learning something there. If the child sees something on TV and says, you know, I want to give this, you try your best you can to give the children those opportunities. Now, as they get a little bit older and they begin to understand other people's feelings, so now we're talking about the five-year-old, what you can do is set up behavior patterns or activities in which you can model both for yourself and for them activities that they can participate in. Now, it's kind of important that they get to sort of choose the activity to a point meaning is is you know are they concerned about people not being hungry are they concerned about people not having clothing are they concerned about kids who are in the hospital it needs to be something they connect to themselves because we are talking about that time frame that we just talked about with eric said where they need to be able to be industrious where they can choose sort of their own things and so if you tell them automatically that no we're not going to do that charity because that's not important enough then again that sort of downplays my ability to make some choices and decisions that might be helpful you know they may see make a wish and they want to do something like that so who says that you can't help them gather a little money up sell a few little games and donate that money to make a wish have them do all the processing of that or maybe they can help you with whatever activity that you do so for my household we've been giving to st jude's since I think St. Jude's existed. Um, I don't remember a time when we haven't been writing a check every month to St. Jude's and sending it in. And as a little kid, I actually helped write those checks. I wrote the little amount in. Now we've increased our amounts over the years, but I can distinctly remember doing this and I'm still helping my mother write checks to St. Jude every month. So it was a behavior pattern that sort of stuck with me and I look at this and I think maybe my childhood learned this. So Very early on, my child started helping write the checks to St. Jude. So it just kind of helped us make sure that we are showing that we're empathetic. And if we model that behavior, hopefully the children will pick that up and be able to take some of that into their adulthood. So the last topic we're going to tackle in this lecture is gender. And gender is something that's a very complex issue. First of all, our society is not gender neutral. We have social roles that guide us on how we should behave, how we should look, 
and what is appropriate or inappropriate behavior. Um, while the next generation may be coming up and being a little bit more unisexed, right now, gender is still very important to us as a society. Even little babies are basically labeled with colors or hair bands. How often have you met a parent and when you look down at the baby, if you say, oh, what a wonderful little girl and it's a boy, they defend very quick. Oh, that's a boy, it's a boy. Or if you vice versa, oh, she's a girl. And to really make sure you know that this baby who's just a little blob is a girl, they put this headband with a big flower on it to really identify this as a girl. We are very interested in making sure people identify our children correctly. And why do we do that? Because we feel that if they're identified wrong, then they may not be given the appropriate um, behaviors that we expect for this. Now, there are lots of different theories out there on gender. Kohlberg is one of the ones that's kind of interesting. Um, it's a little bit interesting because his was originally created a while back ago. Uh, we're going to talk about Kohlberg a little later on when we talk about moral development. But there isn't a total disrespect for his anymore. There may be some changing in it, but it still seems to hold up even with the more modern way that we look at things. So the first thing is he said the first stage is what he calls gender labeling. And basically by the age of three, um, a child can say whether they are a girl or a boy, as well as the gender of other people. However, they don't really understand if this is a characteristics that can change over time, like the length of somebody's hair or the clothes that you're wearing. So what's interesting is the only way that they know that they're a boy or a girl is because someone told them that they are a boy or a girl. Um, it's not that uncommon in daycare centers when you hear a little two and well, three year olds start to talk and you hear a boy start to talk about his penis. Um, he may call it a willy or something else. And this girl is going, what the heck is that? I don't understand what you're talking about. And the boy will pull his pants out. He says, you know, a penis. And the girl will pull her pants out and go, I don't have one. It's missing. <laughs> and that's because we don't see each other naked. Um, it's not like in the days we lived on the Great Plains of Africa where everybody was running around without clothes. And so we could see the difference between a boy and girl with their anatomies. Uh, today, we hide those parts of us uh, for very specific reasons. <laughs> I'm not advocating running around naked, but it does make it a little bit harder for a girl and a boy to really understand what the difference is unless they're told. So they get to preschool, you know, somewhere around three or four that this will start and what they begin to realize is is that gender is stable that children realize that boys will grow up to be dads and girls will grow up to be moms however what's interesting is that they still don't understand that their gender can't change in appearance or unless they choose to so what happens is is that they tend to have now understood what boy and girl is by standards we set out there so girls wear pink and boys wear blue. Girls have long hair. Boys have short hair. Um, and when they begin to understand these standards, that's how they were able to label and understand if somebody else was a different gender. So now all of a sudden you've got this girl who suddenly won't wear anything but dresses. Because to her, a girl wears dresses and a boy wears shorts and pants. And if she starts wearing shorts and pants, well... I don't want to be a daddy. I want to be a mommy. Now, they understand that a boy will become a man, but remember, they don't know that their gender won't change. And so it's the time when you might see little girls who won't cut their hair off or boys who won't wear certain colors. I always remember my nephew once when I said I was going to buy him a shirt. He said, now you don't buy me girl purple. And I kind of looked at him and I said, well, I'd never buy you girl purple. And what is girl purple? I was planning on buying a green shirt. And as it turns out, he saw lavender as girl purple, but that royal purple is boy purple. To me, it's just purple, but he saw a difference in it and he was afraid to get girl purple. Now, when they get to be somewhere eh, between four and seven, and it will depend on the kid, we get gender consistency. 
So by about six or seven, children begin to understand that their sex is permanent across all situations and over all time. You know, once they develop this understanding, they also begin to act as a member of their sex. Meaning is, is that they understand who they are and that that's what they're going to be. Now, we're not talking about people who believe that they have the wrong gender, and that's a whole different conversation. But what we're talking about is for the majority of the population. Now, in this way, what Kohlberg is actually arguing is that the most important aspects of gender development is not so much as biological instincts or cultural norms, but rather it's a child's cognitive understanding of the social world around them. And I use this particular image right here from Target. Now, Target luckily has taken this out, but you'll notice that there are two sets of building sets. There's regular building sets and there's girl building sets. Not that anybody can have a building set. So if I was a young boy and I was in gender stability, I would not want something that was labeled a girl building set because I might think that I'd become a girl then, even though I might like to have the stable, even though I might like to have the horses because I would like to be a show jumper one day or I think about having a farm. You know, what happens is, is that the girl wants to have that dinosaur set, but eh, you know, that's a boy set and I don't want to be a boy. So there's a lot of pressure on young children to perform and to figure out what social roles are and then maintain those social roles. So this is where they look to adults to figure this out. And a lot of imitation goes through this. Also, we have to understand that there's a social status within their own groups. So we don't find that people want to be outside their groups at this young age. And remember, we're talking about little kids, preschoolers. We're not talking about older kids at this point. And so the little boy and the little girl want to be able to go play with their little boys and their little girls. And so they may look to what they call their leaders on what it is to be this or what it is to be that. And they want to imitate those so that they can make sure that they are identified. Because remember, with gender stability, it's all about what I appear like to understand my gender, um, that I can make sure that I'm within the group that, that I believe that I should be in. Now, some cultures are a lot more gender oriented than others. So if we look down in South America, gender identity is much stronger down there than it is here in the United States. So in the United States, we are we have no question about that both a man and a woman can be a doctor. But what the interesting thing is, is how do little kids see it? Is there still stereotypes? And not too long ago in Australia, they did kind of an interesting experiment. They went to a whole bunch of kindergartners, first and second graders, and they asked them to draw three pictures. The first picture was of a firefighter. The second picture was of a doctor. And the third picture was of a jet pilot, an uh, Air Force sort of jet pilot. Now, over 90% of the pictures were all male. So the kids only saw those three roles as basically male roles, a very small percentage. And the small percentage who did draw somebody who wasn't male, it was for the doctor. They drew female doctors. There wasn't one female jet pilot drawn. Now, after they drew the pictures, they then said, would you like to meet these people? Would you like to meet a jet pilot? Would you like to meet a doctor? Would you like to meet a firefighter? And of course, all three were women. And that was very confusing. There was even one little boy who said, you can't be a jet pilot. Girls can't fly jets. So we know by first grade, by kindergarten, that gender roles and gender identity is already out there in, in their sense of mind of what a typical person would look like who, do, who does that. And that's because it's all based back on those schemas. Now, remember schemas, and I know it seems like a long time ago, but those schemas that have been formed are really hard to get rid of. Because remember, it's my thumbnail. It's my way to help me kind of get through the situation. And if somebody has asked me to draw a jet pilot, I'm going to pull upon the schema I have of what a jet pilot is. And so if it only reflects a guy being a jet pilot, then as a little kid, that's what I'm going to draw. Now, I covered this just a little bit um, a second ago, but 
gender schema theory says that how children basically learn about gender is through what we see and learning those schemas with if they decide it's an object activity or behaviors that are labeled as male or female and then they learn that they should do those activities because they see themselves as male or female in fact once kids begin to understand their gender they'll be more likely to play with gender specific toys watch gender specific television shows and we really have to be careful about those gender specific television shows what we are seeing is that sometimes we are not putting forth um the best viewpoint you might want to say as far as the gender is concerned so uh, having a, a young son myself i will say that at one point i got really disappointed with the cartoons that are on there for boys because it seemed like the smart boy was always sort of a geek and to be smart was not to be the leader to be the most intelligent one actually you got made fun of um and there were some episodes where the sort of popular boy was suddenly found to be smart and he didn't want to be seen as smart because when he was smart he was put into a class full of kind of nerdy kids um you know that that doesn't really give our young children the thought that to be smart is a good thing especially if you're male now we don't see that in the females tv shows in fact in the female tv shows the smart one is the leader so what kind of things are we you know sort of telling our children when we look at some of these activities especially when it's multiple shows not just one show but show after show after show we can really begin to see where we might be influencing sort of their viewpoints now there is one more theory that's out there evolutionary theory and we shouldn't um, ignore this one because we know that there's a difference between men and women there's a physical difference between men and women our brains are not exactly the same different doesn't mean one's better than the other just means different um, what's one of the interesting things is is that we probably know that the reason that certain genetic makeup of women and certain genetic makeup of men were successful or are, are with us because they were successful meaning is is that as a man i had to be able to throw a spear i had to be able to bring something down so an upper chest a strong upper chest would be something that would help me bring home food and if i could bring home food then there was a better chance that my children would eat and my dna would get passed along with women those women who were able to multitask and do multiple things at one time be able to keep an eye on their kid be able to keep an eye on the guy be able to keep an eye on spiders and find some place to sleep tonight and oh also find some berries to eat those women probably were more successful in being able to raise children who got to adulthood thus their dna moved forward so there is this evolutionary theory that said that a lot of the traits and behaviors that we have sort of encompassed as males and females come from this evolutionary plan that has developed over time you know we know that there's a different body for different people depending on where they grew up um, or evolved you might want to say within the world we know that people who evolved up in the himalayas they have more red blood cells than most people because of the light oxygen we know that people who developed closer to the poles are lighter skinned everything by the way is lighter skin look at the polar bears and the rabbits and all of that we know that people who developed their bodies more toward the equator wound up being darker skinned because they needed the melanin to protect themselves from the uv rays um, we even know that certain groups of people have more webbing in their fingers if they tended to develop more toward the coast areas so we know that the body adjusted for the needs that we needed um, to be a successful species so this argument is also that there was a developmental issue within the brain and our traits and our behavior patterns so that we could continue to be a successful species now there's a difference between saying that there's a genetic difference between us and saying that one is superior and one is submissive you might want to say um, we do know that all species need both males and females to survive and the truth is is we don't need a whole lot of males we need a lot of females but we don't need a whole lot of males 
So in one way, it's kind of interesting that when you're talking about babies and the ones that we tend to toss around and think of them hardy, we tend to think of the boys. And yet boar babies are much more fragile than girl babies. Um, they're much more likely to die. Girls are much more hardy. Um, than boy babies and that's also why we may mature faster we're a hardier person you also need women to be able to I hate to say it pop out babies early now in today's society we don't expect 10 year olds or 12 year olds to be having babies but if we think about back on the Great Plains of Africa yeah we were having babies pretty fast we actually think that we may have been having babies by the time that they were seven or eight we didn't have long lives don't forget we weren't living to be 80 years old back then and so we were probably popping out babies a little bit earlier than we do now our gestation period uh, being nine months is also a rather long time for a, a group of people who are basically prey animals. Um, we become predators once we make tools, but before that we were, we were eaten. We were eaten a lot. So, you know, this concept of gender and our, what part of our gender comes from our genetics versus what part of our gender comes from our culture is something that gender um, psychologists are always studying. So that's it for chapter five. And that also ends, I do believe, uh, the week for most of you. I hope that you um, got something out of this. If you have any questions, there's my email address. And there's just not much left to see once you've seen a dog and a lobster fighting. See you soon. <laughs>